when you don't know the way of the Spirit. Oak House Church brings to you the word of life, which is able to build you up and offer you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. Sit back and listen, and may your life become more like that of Christ as you encounter His Word. God bless you. All the entities that dwell in heaven to bow before your throne tonight, we worship you. We ask that you accept our praise and our worship tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus, Holy Spirit of the living God, we acknowledge your office and your presence. You are the most important person in this place. You are a gift that was given to us. We ask that you brood over us tonight. We ask that you teach us the words of eternal life. We ask that you leave no person under the sound of my voice, Lord. Leave them not the same way they came, but transform them. Renew minds, transform lives. Let there be a transformation. Let there be a new thing that you will do even as your word comes tonight in your church. Father, this is our prayer in Jesus' mighty name. We have prayed. Amen. Amen. Can we please be seated quietly? I want to use this opportunity again to ask everyone, just in case you've not yet turned off your phone, please can you do so quietly? Praise God. I bring you greetings from Pastor and Rev. Um, they are not with us tonight. What that means is that we are home alone. <laughs> so, but we love our parents. Uh, so, um, that's why they are not here, just in case you're wondering. So, we'll go straight into what we have tonight. So tonight's message, I've titled it, The Wonderful Christian Experience. That's my title for it, The Wonderful Christian Experience. So tonight, my prayer is that the message that we will be hearing, that the Lord will be, the Holy Spirit will be giving to us tonight, will touch everyone. You will find something, you will draw something from it tonight. And I pray for that understanding. Okay. I want to believe that anyone who had said yes to Jesus Christ, that means anyone who considers themselves saved, born again, you've answered to that altar call, you believe that Jesus is your Lord. Jesus is your personal Savior. I believe that there are certain experiences that that person who has done so must have. I believe that there are certain experiences. So tonight, we are going to be looking at what those experiences are. And again, I want to believe that there are more to what, you know, the few that we have here. But I believe these ones you know, are the ones that we'll be looking into tonight. And these experiences are what I call the pointers. They are the proof that indeed we have met with Jesus. Okay? So what that means is anytime any man comes to Christ, right, there must be something that will give. Are you getting me? Something happens. So it's very unfortunate that today you find people who you ask them, have you given your life to Jesus? Have you made Jesus your Lord and personal Savior? They say yes. Although you can't confront them to tell them no, you have not. But you know that if indeed this person has met with Jesus, there must be the proof of that. So there is a proof. So, Christianity is about Jesus Christ. I mean, this statement that you've just heard now can never be overemphasized. Christianity is about a man called Jesus Christ. We often hear pastors say that. I mean, 
When you begin to dig deep into the word of God, you realize that indeed we don't understand how much it is about Jesus Christ. So the importance of this, you can see it throughout the scriptures. Even before the foundations of the earth was laid, the Bible says that God chose us in Christ before the foundation, before Adam was created. So that is why it is not a surprise that, you know, from ages to ages, from generation to generation, men, women, they rise up from time immemorial and they continue to talk about this person we call our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You look at throughout the scriptures, you know, like the scripture we just read that is in Ephesians 1, um, 3 to 4, you know, the Bible talks about how we were chosen in Christ. It says, according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So we're talking about Jesus. If you go back to verse 3, you will see that he was talking about Christ there. So Moses, let me even back to that. God himself, if you look at Genesis 3 verse 15, that was the first time even God himself mentioned and said that the seed of the woman, he didn't say the seeds. Pastor was having a conversation with us the other day and he, and he confirmed that Jesus is the one that was being talked about here. So, Jesus, God also testified even of him at the seed of the woman. So, before time at Eden, that is at the beginning, Moses, the prophets, you know, men rise up in different times, in different places. Some of them were in palaces. Some of them were in fields. Some of them were in exile. But for some reason, thousands of years will pass. Another man comes up and begins to talk about Elijah. I mean, Isaiah comes up and say that a virgin shall be with, you know. So you continue to look at the scriptures. You keep, they keep pointing to this person called Jesus. You know, Jesus himself in the book of Luke 24, verse, from verse 44 to 47. Please, if you can project it, let's look at it. It says, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which we are written in the law of Moses the prophets and the Psalms concerning me of course we know that the gospel is about him we know that the epistle is about him we know the revelation is about him so everything points to this person our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so what were they saying they were talking about God's plan for humanity. And that plan is in Christ Jesus. So you find people like Amos, a shepherd boy, Zechariah. These were men that lived at different times. You know, kings. David woke up and said, my Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Why? Everybody kept on. So the, the, the reason why I'm stressed on this is for us to understand that there is something, you know, about him that we need to pay closer attention to. So my prayer tonight is that, you know, that we will not just be caught up again in knowledge, okay, obviously I know these things, but that the Holy Spirit will help us to understand because myself, I'm seeking for answers. I want to know more. I want to know more. I don't know if there's anybody in the house that wants to know more, <laughs> you know. So they talked about the predestination, you know, it was about him, the redemption plan, the new life, the eternal plan, that is everlasting life and eternal life. Everything were all found in Jesus Christ. You know, not to talk down on education, for some of us who are big on education, you want to have your PhD. I believe that if there is any school that heaven is interested in that any man should have. You know, I think it will be the knowledge of who Jesus is. Jesus is life. That is what it means. He said this himself, I am life. So it has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with, you know, 
Knowledge is just what it is. Jesus is life. Everything. So, you know, the knowledge of Christ. The knowledge of Christ. You know, so when you look at the scriptures, you, you begin to understand why they talk about, you know, they talk about the milk of the world. You know, the solid food, the strong meat and all that. You know, these are, you know, these are to show us that the, the whole experience is about the knowledge of who Jesus is. So if there is any school, like I said, it has to be. No wonder when you look at the book of Ephesians 4, the Bible talks about prophets, about apostles, about teachers, about evangelists and pastors and all that. Why? To teach the church about Christ. To teach so you, maybe some of them are prof um, professors, some are doctors in the real, you know, when you want to look at it from you know, a layman's point of view, but that is what they do to teach us. So we must strive to know about Jesus. We must enroll, we must seek to know him as if we were in a school, a school of life. For you to pass it, for you to be able to be successful in this life, you must have to enroll in that school where they teach the knowledge of who Jesus is. You know, hence why we hear the phrases like, you know, study to show yourself approved. You have no soul learned Christ. You know, that this book of law will not depart from your mouth. That you should, you know, so it shows that this is a school. It's a school for us. So we must learn Christ. We must study. The studying we are doing is not to have knowledge. It's to do what? It's to know him. Please, you can look at that scripture I quoted about the prophets and apostles in Ephesians 4, I think in, from 11 to 15, if I'm not mistaken. Praise God. So the importance of learning, the importance of knowing about Jesus is not just for head knowledge. The whole purpose is to raise men to be Christ-like. Praise God. To raise men to be Christ-like. That these men will have something in common. They will have the same way of thinking. They will have the same spirits. They will have the same conviction. They will have the same truth. You know, today, truth is relative. One in the body of Christ, you can even have people talking about two different things as if it's not the same or one person that we are all, you know, we are following. We have one Lord. We are one body. So the importance of going and knowing about Jesus, the reason why we must strive to know about him is so that we can be, you know, we can be like him. So there are not two kinds of Christ. There is only one. And I want to believe that every man that must see his face at the end of the day must be like him. He says that when he shall appear, we shall be as he is, right? He says, as he is, so are we. So there is so much emphasis for us to be like Christ. But do you know the truth of the matter? We have Christians, but we don't have Christ-like people. Right? I can challenge you to say, if you stand there, out there, and if you put an unbeliever, there will not be any difference. Because men cannot see Christ. If men can see Christ, men will come to Christ. That is true us. So the importance of being like Christ and not a Christian, having that sticker, I'm a Christian, you know, I think it was Mahatma Gandhi that said, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. So it was way too different. We must be like Christ. That is the goal. Or rather, that is the goal, yes. So our differences today that we see, our confusion in the body of Christ is due to the lack of knowledge of Christ. So we must have the knowledge of who Jesus is. It can never be overemphasized. Okay, so now, going back to these experiences, 
everyone or anyone that has come to Jesus, we must have these experiences. It's like a common denominator. And I believe that when we begin to look at it, you understand. Okay? So first of all, the first experience, if you write it down, is the salvation experience. Praise God. The salvation experience. And now, when I talk about the salvation experience, I don't mean somebody who has said, Lord Jesus, come into my life, Lord Jesus, I make you. That's not what I mean. This salvation experience is a wonderful, wonderful thing. That is if we understand it. You know? Why do I think it's wonderful? Please, can you put on 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12? And I will read it, and then we can just, you know, I'm sure you'll agree with me. It says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that you should come unto you, searching what or what manner of, please, can you project NLT if you don't mind? So that we can, okay. It says, This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about. When they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you, they wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great joy afterward. Twelve, please. We were told that they were told, I beg your pardon, that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now, this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. The prophets longed to know about this salvation. This salvation that you and I have. They were told, even by the Spirit of Christ, it was not for them. They searched for it. They were wondering because I believe the revelation of whatever it is that they had was so amazing. I don't know if, if you look, look at that scripture very well. They wanted to know. They longed. They looked into it. They marveled. What, what is this mystery? What is this Thing we are seeing. Who are these things for? For you and I. The Bible even said that angels are eagerly looking with amazement. Salvation. I mean, I just want that to sink in. It ought to sink in. That is why, you know, when Jesus was now born in the book of Luke 2, you know, from verse 10, if you look at 10, when the angels announced, look at what this angel said. He says, but the angel reassured them. That is when he appeared to the shepherd. He said, don't be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Look at 14, please. 14, I beg your pardon. No, not 14. Let's go to 14. He says, then the angels appeared to him. Other angels, a host of them, uncountable, and they were screaming and they were shouting bringing glory to God. They were saying, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. Salvation. What did these people know? What did the angels do? What did these prophets do about salvation that we don't know? What do they know that we don't know? My prayer is that the Holy Spirit will reveal it to us in the mighty name of Jesus. So the ex salvation experience Okay? It's, please, if you look at um, Luke 24, 50 to 53, let me tell you what I believe should happen to any man that comes to Jesus. This was after Jesus had spoken to the disciples, you know, sorry, the, um, those ones that gathered, uh, the disciples, I guess. So he was talking to them. He spoke to them about what was written about him, that all these things must be fulfilled. He opened their understanding and they understood the scripture. So I believe that more or less he was preaching to them about himself. Right? So he preached to them and then he told them where the Holy Spirit will come and all that. 
and then please, 50, and he says, Then Jesus led them to Bethany, and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. 51, please. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. 52. So they worshipped him, and then returned to Jerusalem, filled with great joy. 53. And they spent all their time in the temple, praising God. Did you have this experience as salvation? Did you see what happened to them? They were so filled with joy. They were praising God. They were worshipping God. They were in the temple always. So you see, there is no way you can come to Jesus and they will still be following you up. You can't have this experience and they will follow you up. They don't. It's impossible. It's impossible. They spent all their time in the temple. Why? Because these men were convicted. There is conviction when a man, a man that has just had the experience is like a madman. People must call you mad because you will act like a madman. You just discovered something. You just discovered something. You must act abnormal. The conviction makes men to, to to not keep quiet. To not keep quiet. You can see another experience in the book of Acts 2, verse 27, please. That conviction says, for Acts 2, 37, I beg your pardon. 37, please. It says, Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? What should we do? There is conviction. That conviction is what makes men to act. Imagine, I was reading about Apostle Paul. I think you can see that in Acts 9, 17 to 20. Immediately, Apostle Paul encounters salvation. The Bible says that he... Go to 20. Go to 18, please. So when Aeneas came to pray for him, Okay, it says instantly something like scales fell from um, Saul's eyes and he regained sight. Then he got up and was baptized. 19, please. Afterwards, he ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. Then 20. And immediately, he began preaching about Jesus. He began immediately. That must be conviction. You, must, you, you shouldn't wait and say, okay, not, be, not that you know, I don't think Apostle Paul knew as much as he later knew, but the point is that that conviction is like as Jeremiah said, fire locked up in your bones. You just can't keep quiet. Men must know your neighborhood. Oh my God. I remember when it happened to me. My gate man, because I couldn't pray, I would come outside, I would be shouting. Something happened to me. Nobody followed me up. No, with all humility I'm saying this. Nobody followed me up. Because there must be a conviction. Another one of that salvation experience must be like you saw in that scripture, the joy of salvation. There was joy. There is joy. You know, one of the reasons why you see anybody genuinely that have experienced the salvation, this salvation, right, experience, you see them, they forgive so easily, Right? They, 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 they just, they are smiling, they are happy, they are joyful. It, it's an experience. You, you just want to forgive. In fact, some people will pick up the phone and start calling all the people that they have issues with. I want to tell you I'm forgiving you. I remember my brother, you know, calling me from Canada to tell me he has just given his life and all that. I knew that, that was what was happening to him. Because we have not spoken to them in a while, you know, because of some issues we had back then. But immediately, he called me. Because the, the thing just makes you light. Burdens are lifted off your shoulders. Something just happens to you. It's a wonder. It's a very wonderful feeling that everybody must have. And this joy radiates. You go to your office, people see you, and they're saying, there is something about you. I mean, what? I mean, you see people in your house. Yeah, some people will just try to, you know, even to bust your bubble a bit. 
But because you, what you are you experience is genuine, you you just maybe even if it's painful, you just cry some more, but you forgive them, <laughs> you know, because you are basking under the euphoria, you know, this wonderful experience. So there is commitment when you have the salvation experience. You are committed to the kingdom of God. Okay? You saw them in that um, Luke 24. They were in the temple. They were worshipping. They were there. Again, you can see in Acts 2.42. Can we look at it? After the message of Peter caught their hearts and all that. Can you project Acts 2.42? And all believers, you see what they did? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship and to sharing in meal, including the Lord's prayer, the Lord's supper, and to prayer. Commitment. If you go and look, you will just see that they were convicted, 3,000 were added, and immediately they were now doing all these things. Devotion. I want to, be, I want to maybe just to prick some consciences here. So people are still even being casual to come to church. Some people are still even being casual. Yeah, I mean, at times you wake up, you feel, but do you know what keeps you going? This experience. It keeps you going, no matter what is happening. Yeah, sometimes you are grumpy and all that. You know? But this is real. You know what you encountered. Even when you have made a mistake and you you, maybe you've made some mistake. Most times what pull, pull, pull people back is the conviction. Not because, you know, some people, if you've not had the experience, you can sin. Now, nobody advo is advocating for sin, but when you've made a mistake, some people just run away and from there they just... But some people will make a mistake. The only thing is that, God, I am sorry, but I want to come back. When David made that mistake, he was saying, restore in me the joy of salvation. Do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. That is because there is an experience that he is hard. Praise God. So you see that these experiences, if you are, if you've had them, you will nod. You will be concurring to what I'm saying, right? You know, but that is just what it is. You must have to have these experiences. It's important. You know, so one of the evidence of this salvation experience again is um, the new life, right? You know, we, we, we may not be able to go into all that, but if you look at 2 Corinthians 5 17, what happened is that it says, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. It says, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. You know, if you look at the NKJV version. So, there is something new happened. That old man is gone. Okay? That is why Colossians 3 from verse 1 talks about that you have been raised. If you can quickly please project it. The NLTS. Um, no, I'm talking about Colossians 3, 1 now. Okay? It says, if you have been raised with Christ, then seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting. If you look at NLT, it says, if you have been raised to a new life with Christ. So there is a new life. All things passed away. At salvation, all things passed away. You know, we are raised to a new life because the old life, you know, we died to that life. So our real life, if you look at that, if you go down Colossians 3, 1 to 4, it's talking about that our real life is hidden with Christ in God. Okay? So somebody might be asking, what is this new life? You know? I can just try it and explain it in the best possible way. That new life is a life that is in love with Jesus. You begin to love what Jesus loves. The new man loves righteousness. You know, when the Bible says that Jesus loved righteousness and hates iniquity, the new man just loves righteousness. He doesn't want to do, you know, you don't have to tell him to do what is right. It's a nature that has, he has inherited. 
that makes him just to love righteousness. Even you, you can be wrong and you will tell yourself, and somebody else is right, you tell yourself, oh, you are wrong. Just accept that you'll be fighting yourself because the spirit of God in you, that new man knows that this is right. You are not going to be playing games. That is why the, the person who has had this experience gets into trouble with other people. Because you cannot just, you know, someone will tell you, but I'm your brother now. In fact, the problem I had with my brother then was because I wouldn't stand with him for something that was, I couldn't just stand with them. So when he now gave his life, he called me. Praise God. So, I mean, the point I'm trying to make is that it has nothing to do with emotions. It has nothing to do with your feeling. It's just that you love what Jesus loves. And you hate what he hates. So the realities of heaven, you know, becomes real. Any man who is now, you know, when the old things have passed away, that new man, your reality, you can, you know, now, maybe there is a reason why people act that way, but there is no way you can have this new light. And the things that would be utmost or topmost in your mind would not be about kingdom realities. That is why he says, if you have been raised with Christ, set your realities. So set your sight on the realities of heaven. Because that is the new man. The new man is thinking about heaven. The new man is thinking about the kingdom of God. The new man is thinking about anything that will bring God glory. That is how the new man thinks. The new man does not come and say, ah, until I, when I will become rich. And There's nothing wrong, but there are some languages. That, that is why it says we don't pray for sure. You can't pray for sure and bad. You can't pray, pray for those things. Even if you are a babe, with time, you just realize that there is no way you can be talking to God about, you know, why? Because the new man begins to see the, that reality. You know that there are things about heaven. Value. Things that have heaven's value. You know, I used to tell people that, you see, the, your value system in the kingdom of God is, will determine the kind of presence you attract. Your value, what you, your heart desires would attract this celestial beings, I mean the heavenly host in the kingdom of God. Because you, they, they can see a like-minded, they will see like-mindedness in what you're doing. Imagine when your heart desire is, Lord, that's your kingdom. Or maybe you see the world the way it is, and it is spinning. You know, some people ask God, Father, what is in your heart? I want to know what is in your heart. I want to see your burdens. Why wouldn't heaven be interested in such a person? The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord ranges to and through the air looking for those whose heart are stayed on him. Praise God. So the new life, the life of faith begins. You know, there is a life of faith. You know, everything that we, we do is faith in Christ. Faith in the finished work of, you know, Redemption, of, that is what faith is. And the power in everything is. So that new man is not somebody who depends on the blood of um, goats and all those things. They depend on the sacrifice that Jesus has made. So it's a life of faith. So that new man is a man of faith. Is a man of faith. That's, you know, when Jesus asks that question, you know, it really points at the importance of faith. He says, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Because our life will have to be a life of faith. The just shall live. You know, pastor is very big on faith. The just shall live by faith. So, the new man talks differently from the old man. He behaves differently. You know, you don't fight. You know, there are some things you just don't do anymore. You know, there are some things you just don't do. Like we, you used, the old person used to do. You know, so your desires begins to align with the desires of heaven or the mandate of heaven. Praise God. Can we look at 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20? 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20. Please. It says, okay. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20. 
And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself, through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. Go on. For God was in Christ, listen, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them. And he gave us now this wonderful message of reconciliation. 20. So we are Christ's ambassador. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. So this was what God did with Christ, is now doing to us. That's how the new man is. The new man is a man who is into the ministry of reconciliation. You, 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 you are so, so, um, how do you put, put it? You, you, you are desperate for souls to come in. Because you are now an ambassador. You are, you know, you want, God is begging men and he's through us. He's pleading that men should come back to God. Come back to God. So that new man, that is your agenda. That is your focus. That is your life. Praise God. Okay. So now we move on to the next experience, which is the Holy Spirit experience. That's the second one. So what we looked at in the new life is the evidence of salvation if it is joining. You are now a new person. So at salvation, what occurs at salvation is regeneration, right? God, you know, takes away the old heart, the dead heart, right? And puts a new spirit, a, his spirit in us, a new spirit, a new heart, and all that, right? So that is why, you know, most times you can... You can be genuinely saved, right? But you have not had the Holy Ghost experience. You know, in that book of Luke, he was telling them, wait until the Holy Spirit will come. Right? That was what he was telling them. Wait until the Holy Spirit comes, right? But they still had joy. So you can have the joy of salvation, still you have not had the Holy Ghost experience. That's why he said to them, I know you guys are now here, you are my disciples and all that, but wait, tarry in Jerusalem. You know, until, you can see that, um, you can see in um, Luke 24, 49, please. He says, now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Okay, now go to 52. Just 52 of that scriptures. This is 49. And he says, they worshipped him and they were filled. So they had joy. But yeah, the Holy Spirit, they've not yet experienced him. I don't know if that makes sense. Right? Okay. So, you know, so they're, they're, again, if you look at Acts 19, 1 to 2, just so that we can establish the fact that somebody can be saved, yet have not had their Holy Ghost experience. It says in, from 1, it says, when Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus and on the coast where he found several believers too. He says, ask them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied, we haven't even heard believers. They've not even heard about the Holy Spirit. There is an experience of the Holy Ghost. At times, you know, we don't really understand this. There is so much. You can be a believer, but you have not had the experience of the Holy Ghost. And one of the evidence when you have the experience is what? Praying in tongues. Okay, now, um, if we can look at verse 6. Please go to 6 of that scripture. It says, Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them. And they did what? They spoke in other tongues and prophesied. Evidence of the Holy Ghost. So they were believers. They were believers. So another experience, another um, evidence is, you can find out in Galatians 5.22, right? So these are the fruit, the fruit of the Holy Ghost. The evidence is that you must have joy. You must have peace. You must have love. You must have patience. You must have kindness. You must have goodness. You know, we know all these things, but we don't really, I don't think we all have all of them. 
faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If I step on your toes now, some people, they go change them for you, right? So we shouldn't be like 23 says, right? Sorry, go down to 26, I beg your pardon. Go back down to 26. He says, let us not be conceited or provoked or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. At times you find this thing more than the first one we just listed, the joy, the peace. You find this thing more, jealousy, conceit, this, you know, all those things. But that would not be your story after tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Can we look at Acts 13, verse 52, please? So that I want us to differentiate the fact that, you, that joy, you can have joy and Holy Ghost separately. It says, and the believers we are filled with what? With joy and with the Holy Spirit. So joy and Holy Spirit are both two different experiences. You can have joy, like those people had. Sir? The joy of salvation, you can have it. But there is also another experience. That is the experience of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. So the evidence, you pray. Let me, you know, challenge some of us. How can a Christian pray without praying in the Spirit? How? I wonder what that person is praying. Sorry, with you, all due respect. Because you know why? Because you can't even tarry in his presence. By the time you're done, you'll be repeating the same thing. Your vocabulary will, I mean, what do you know? Are you an English teacher? Your vocabulary will finish. But there is this experience. You know, we're not going into all that. But when the Bible says that he that prays like this talks to God, don't you want to talk to God? Don't you want to talk to God? Don't you want to be edified? We don't even understand that it is a big thing to pray in a language that the world does not know. That the enemy does not know. When you're praying in your words, even though I know that the enemy cannot do anything you know, for a believer, but he, he can understand the English you're speaking. But he, no, the devil, demons don't understand tongues. In heaven, you get lost in God. We have experiences. Church is not just about coming to sit down and acting. No, there is more. And the funny thing is, that the wonderful thing about it, I beg your pardon, is that the more you know, the more there is to know. In fact, what you know is that I don't know as much. The reality, the more you are, the more you know you don't know. Hi. That was what Apostle Paul said, the depth of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable. Deep waters. Praise God. It's a wonderful experience. Don't you, don't you think so? So, the next experience is the hunger experience. Matthew 5, 6 talks about those who hunger and test for righteousness. First Peter, please can you project First Peter 2, 1 to 2? Wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking, too, as newborn babes, do what? Desire the sincere milk of the world that you may grow thereby. Hunger. Those who hunger and thirst, they will be satisfied, right? They will be, right? And then it says, desire. Some scripture says crave. Haven't you heard the word, I am craving for something? You just, the hunger experience. If you don't have hunger, right, something is sincere. If you must have hunger, hunger is part of it. You will desire. That songwriter said, the more I know you, the more I want to know you. There is a hunger. Those songs we minister with, he says, Oh God, I want to know you, that I may know. There is a hunger. There must be hunger. And if you look at that verse 1, it says, 
You know, you must lay aside. So there is no way you have all this thing in verse 1 and you have hunger. No. Two landlords cannot stay in one house. It says, laying aside malice, all guile, all hypocrisy. Now, as newborn babes, these are the old man. The old man needs to go for hunger to come in. So there must be hunger. Do you have hunger for God? There are some kind of prayers you pray when you have hunger. So we crave the pure spiritual milk. He calls it the word. Why? So that we can grow. But you know, after the milk, it graduates, right? It graduates to what? Solid food. Can you look at Hebrews 5, 12 to 14, please? Quickly. It says, you have been believers for so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babes who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. 14. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. You see why you cannot stay on milk? So at times, there is a time come you are weaned off milk or you wean yourself off milk naturally and you begin to crave for solid food, for maturity. So you see, if there is no hunger, you won't crave for milk, you won't crave. So there is a time when a person is meant to grow. But, you know, babies are hungry. That is why the only time if you have a baby now, it's hunger. You, you put your mouth like this, you do like this. You put your hand like this, you do like this. Hunger. It wants to grow. And all that. And at a time, I'm sure there was a time my son began to reject that um, solution, that milk. He, he wanted something thick, thick, as in to satisfy him. So that is how it must be. As new babes, you grow. You grow. You must hung, get hungry for these things, for solid food. So those who do not have hunger, the danger is that they continue to be babies. But the, the, the babies we're talking about here is not a child. They're the babies that continue to cause problems in the church. That is the disadvantage. They cause problems. They cannot discern. They are the ones that continue to ask for prayers. More things, they would no growth. And you still aren't ready. Three. For you are still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another. You quarrel with each other. You do, doesn't that prove you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? So at times, somebody who stays on milk for so long can even be acting like their old person. Because Paul was writing to Christians here. So there is, it's important for us to desire solid food. So when men stay so much on milk, envy, all those things are still there. So what is the evidence that you are, you are hungry? Right? You'll be studying your word. Right? You'll be studying the word of God. That's the evidence. You will have a healthy study life. You have a very healthy study life. You would, I mean, because you want to grow. You want to be able to discern between right and wrong, between good and evil, right? So you can rightly divide the word of truth, right? The evidence is the maturity, the way you handle things. They give you an assignment to do, a work to do. A mature person will handle it because they know that they are doing it for what? The king. They're not doing it for eye service. They're not doing it for anybody. You just do it for king. And you want to do it acceptably, so that's the evidence. Because you must grow and all that, right? So again, obviously you must be able to teach. After a while, you begin to teach people. He said to them, why are you still having to be taught when you ought to be teachers? Hebrews 5, 1 Corinthians 3. And by the way, 
if you want to show whether you are hungry, Beria is coming up, right? Everybody will turn up for Beria. Yeah, am I? <laughs> so, Beria is seventh. Seventh, right? Oh, okay, on the eighth. So, everybody. You show your hunger. Okay, some of them are now showing that they are not hungry. Okay, I can say. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, the fourth experience is the love experience. Love for God and love for the brethren. Pastor will often say that what started the thing is what will sustain it. What started all this is in the love for God so loved the world. That is what started it, love. So what will sustain will be love. One of the Pauline prayers in Ephesians 3, 17 to 19 talks about, you know, how, you know that then Christ will make his home in your heart as you trust him, you know, as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. 18 says, may be, so that you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. 19. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. The love of Christ. You must know that. So when he says that you may comprehend, that you may experience, in other words, right? You can use that interchangeably. And you may experience the love of Christ. Okay? So, but, you know, with all humility, I don't, I don't think there is any man or, or very few people who can talk about the love of God. Love is a mystery. The Bible talks about the personality of God as love. So, it means that if you can understand, that is why he says that you may know the love of Christ so that you might be filled now, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I'm telling you that, that it's a mystery that we must have to unwrap. Praise God. So when you look at 1 Corinthians um, 13, 1 to 13, you realize that there are some things that when you do them, it doesn't mean that you have love. Right? How can you move mountain with faith? How can you um, give up your body to be burnt? How can you give up all your goods to feed the poor and to do all that? And you can still do that without love. Well, you know, our language of that, when you do that, that means you love, you love somebody, right? But you can still do those things without love. So love is a mystery. Love is a mystery. Somebody can give up themselves to be bond and all that for another, but it can still doesn't mean that you have love. The greatest commandment, the Bible says, is to love God and to love your neighbor, right? But it is important for us to know that for any man to be able to love God and to love one another or to love the brethren, you must first understand the love that came from him first. You can't give what you don't have, right? So let's look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16, please. First, sorry, 1 John 3, verse 16. John talks a lot about love. He says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he... Can you please put um, NLT? We know what real love is, because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we ought, also ought to give up what? Our lives for our brothers and sisters. So you, for you to understand real love, you must have to understand what Jesus did. Before you can do it for anybody else. Praise God. So if you look again at John 4, um, 16. 1 John 16. 1 John 4, 16, I beg your pardon. It says, we know how much God loves us. And we have put our trust in his love. God is love. And all who live in love live in God. And God lives in them. So we must have to know that God loves us before you can love back. The Bible says we first love, he first loved us, right? Praise God. So until we understand this love, can you go back to that first John 3? You look at 17 and 18. 
So you understand, once we understand this law, it says you can now be able to do those same things that 1 Corinthians 13 talks about. No, no, no. Go back to 17. 17. 1 John 3, 17. It says, if someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? 18. Dear children, let us not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. So, but first of all, 16 came for us to know what real love is before you can now start doing, showing love. So we must have to understand. You know, at times, because we don't understand this love, somebody might make a mistake or sin against God, you know, and they can't even forgive themselves. But God has already forgiven you. Right? Why? Because you don't know his love. Of course, we know that we're not talking that you should go and sin and because God loves you. No, I'm, we're not saying that. But the point is that if you understand his love, you will know that once you have already said, God, forgive me and all that, he forgives you. But some people would want to, you know, put on sackcloth, throw all those things and mourn. It's as if God even wants to now beg them to say, okay, don't worry, don't worry. You know, you don't understand the love of God. You cannot love even God. You cannot love, you know, your neighbor. So, God, Jesus continued to reemphasize about love for one another. If you look at John 15, 12, John, John 15, 12, just John 15, 12, he says, this is my commandment, love each other in the same way I loved you. Please, can you put 17 again? Just 17 of that same scripture. This is my command, love each other. First John 3, 22, this is my commandment, love each other. The scripture even talks about, you know, anyone who has loved the brethren has ceased from death to life. So you must, we must have the experience, experience of love. It's an experience, you cannot be a child of God and you don't have love. You don't have love for the brethren, you don't have love for God. The greatest commandment is to love God and to love your neighbor. It's, you must. I want to ask, the church, do we love is a rhetorical question. I don't want us to answer that. So, you know, there are evidences of that love, obviously, right? You know, if you have genuine love for one another, we grow to perfection. You can see that in First John 17. Okay? You become a, you know, First John 4, 17. Also, Philippians 1, verse 9, it says, let your love grow more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. So there is growth in understanding and there is knowledge. So love can grow. And this is, okay, can you, let's look at that um, Philippians 1. I says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and in understanding. Right? Love opens that door. Then, another evidence of your love for God is service. Of course, we know that we are very big. He says, if you love me, you do what? You will keep my commandments. You will do my will. Okay? Hebrews 9.14, please. He says, just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our conscience, sees, from sinful deeds, so that we can worship the living God. For by... The power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. Can you go on, please? I beg your pardon. Hebrews 9, 14. Yeah, I don't know why I missed it, but it was talking about the services there. Okay, just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that you can worship the living God. Okay, I think some scripture says you can serve the living God. I think that's, that's, maybe that's where I'm missing it. Right? You can worship the living God. All right, we'll just move on. Then, again, you look at Luke 1, 
um, 73 to 74, it talks about service to God. So one of the evidence that you love God is to serve him. Also talked about we will serve here in time, we will continue to serve in eternity, even in the book of um, Revelations, right? The Bible says, and they serve God day and night. They are, the service continues. So the evidence of your love, you must serve. So, you know, these are the things that we are, what we're talking about are not things that somebody will have to cajole you to do. Is what happens when a man genuinely comes to Jesus. It's, you want to serve him. Imagine you are saved, you are full of the Holy Spirit, and then all you are doing is to pursue, to get money. It's, there is no way. Something in you knows that service is required. Service is important. You just want to serve and to serve and to serve and to serve and to serve. And to serve. You know, the service now is not for you to, you know, to serve so that somebody can see you. No, it's just that service, it's, 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 it burns out of what you receive, that salvation. You want to serve God. I often say that if my, you know, now, sorry, this is me now. I want, often say that I want to appear before God and I will say to him that if I lived 100% in terms of percentage now, I want to say that 90% I lived for you. If I live 100 years, I want to say to him, Lord, I didn't do anything. But you see, the little I was able to do, 80 years of my life, Look at people like Anna. People that gave their life to serve, you know, to service. They didn't do anything. What did, why did they do it? An experience. A love experience. A love experience. There is nothing you will not give up for this love. You know, when you understand it, you will serve God. And then, If you look at that Philippians 1 verse 10, please, can you go back to Philippians 1 verse 10? It says, now, after that, your love will grow, you know, overflow and then grow into knowledge and understanding and all that. It says, for I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. You see what love can do. Right? Right? If your love overflows, knowledge, understanding, and pure and blameless lives. That is what Paul was trying to tell them from that night. I want you to understand what really matters. Love matters. Love really matters. It will make you to live pure and blameless life. We must have love. You must ask God. So these are the things that, you know, when you're wearing it, it's just for you to pray and know the experiences you're having, the ones, you know, and then you talk to God about it. And then finally, I think the, the last on our list is the death experience. I know when we talk about death now, a lot of us might think, you know, physical death. No. We're talking about the death experience is death to sin. Right? Death to the flesh. Death to the world. You cannot, you cannot be in Christ and you will not die to these things. You, it, it, you must die. You, you must die to them. Okay, let's look at sin first. Romans 6, 10 to 11. Please, can you project it? Romans 6, 10 to 11. It says, when he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you should also consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin. And what? Alive to God through Christ. Please, can you project Galatians 6, 14? I, I, Galatians 6, 14 in NLT, yes. It says... That is the word. He says, as for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So the question is that do you boast about your money? Do you boast about your car? Do you boast about your career, your qualification? You know, Apostle Paul said, May I never boast except what? For the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. And the world's interest in me has also what? Died. It must happen. You must have that experience. So if you are still thinking, ah, when I grow up, the prayer is, well, don't worry, when I arrive. No, there is nothing wrong in being successful. But as the death is occurring, what you'll be saying is that, hi, when I will see Jesus, I want to be able to show him my marks. I have your marks on my body. I want to be able to tell him, Lord, you know, I looked forward to this day. We must be crucified to this world. And what is even more, the world is passing away. Quickly, as we, more than we realize, it's passing away. In fact, the death experience is making us to lose so much interest that the, at times you can even be afraid to be like, my God, I don't even have any ambition again in this world. It, it will come to that. It will come to that. I mean, it's not trying to be noble. No, it's just a, an occurrence. I mean, Jesus was saying to them, cry out for eternal life. Everything that these men, why would fishermen come? Why would an apostle with all his qualifications, why would men just come? Immediately they come, they abandon their lives and start pursuing. And as they are going, they were dying. They were dying. They were dying. And then lastly, let's look at the flesh. Romans 8, 12 to 13. So we looked at death to sin, death to the world, and death to flesh. So Romans 8, 12, it says, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by the dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you will put to death the deeds of the sinful nature, nature you will live. So the flesh, some, as in some scriptures you use the word flesh. So there must be death, you know, that thing that your body always wants to do. You know, we must put, we must put, um, there must be death to that. He says we are debtors but not to the flesh. That is, I think, what um, NKJV says. We are debtors, but not to the flesh. So, we must have this death experience. We must have. In fact, to the point whereby even some people got to the point where, like Apostle Paul, when they said, I even want to die, to be away from this tent, so that I will be at home with the Lord. So, it came to that. It came to that. He said, if you love your life, you will lose it. But those who want to. So there must be, it must happen. In fact, one of the things you try to do every morning is to check your taste board. What, what do you still find palatable about this world? You know, you still, you know, you wake up in the morning, check where your mind is. You go, you know, when you are going through, when there is no money in your pocket, you check again. To know the level of the death that is occurring in you. But there must be death. Death is a separation from the world. Death is a yielded life to the Spirit of God. To bring our body into... Can you please project NIV 1 Corinthians 9.27? Please, NIV 1 Corinthians 9.27. So that you can see what Apostle Paul did. He says, no, I beat my body and make it a, my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for prayer, maybe for pride or whatever. Or the, but he says, that, that language is strong. I beat my body. Oh, some of us pamper our body. <laughs> One small thing, yeah. But that will not be a portion after tonight in Jesus' mighty name. 
So the evidence of death is that you are looking forward to his appearing. You must look. It's a natural thing. I searched the scriptures and I realized that these things was very, very prevalent over, all over the scriptures. It was literally scriptures. Hebrews 9.28. Quickly, can you project it? You would see. I will try and read all the scriptures. Hebrews 9.28, if you can be fast. So Christ was sacrificed once to take once to take away the sins of many and he will appear a second time not to bear sin but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Please, NLT. Those who are eagerly waiting for him. If you look at this in NLT. Then, Philippians 3, 20 to 21. At the mouth of two, my word shall be established. It says, but we are citizens of heaven, right? Where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly, what? Waiting for him to return. As You see the word eagerly. They are there for a purpose. There must be eagerness. There must be eagerness to see Jesus. Then 2 Timothy 4 verse 8. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for what? For all who are eagerly looking forward to his appearing. Jesus will only appear to those who are eagerly. So, but when the world is still tugging at you, tugging so much at you, you won't be eager. You will only talk about it. You will only deceive yourself and pretend. But every day, if you go up, you will see where Apostle Paul was talking in verse 6. He says, my life has already been poured out as an offering. That is why. There is no way you will still hold on to this life, hold on to everything, and you will be eagerly waiting for him. In fact, the test you'll be giving yourself every day is, hi, can I be able to give up my wife for Jesus? Can I be able to give up this, this business? If this business has to go, you will be checking, you'll be doing those tests every day. I keep saying, a lot of us think we can stand. If you cannot, put your, subject yourself to some text. And no, I know some, sometimes just money out of my pocket, my face will change. Then finally, can we look at Revelations 22, 20 to 21? Now, this is the last scripture that ended the, the, the scriptures, the, the word of God. It says, he who is faithful, who is the faithful witness to all these things, say, yes, I am coming soon. Amen, Lord Jesus. That's, it says, amen. Come. I think uh, it says, he who is faithful witness to all these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Exclamation mark. We are screaming for his return. Death makes you do that. Death to this world will make you do that because there is nothing else. What are you waiting for? What are you looking for? Are you still trying to be the next... You know, all those things, because death is occurring. you find people crying out. Hebrews 11 talks about those. Could the Bible say the world was not worthy of them? Abraham was successful, but still he left everything. They didn't consider they were looking. Death occurred. Death must occur. So another evidence is suffering for Christ. At least we hear this a lot from here, right? Suffering, if we are to understand suffering, you realize that most of us will, will see it as a badge of honor. Because suffering, anytime you see suffering mentioned in the scripture, what comes next? Glory. Anytime you see su suffering, the next thing is glory. But we don't. So that is what will only make a man to suffer. Romans 8, 17. Okay. Um, Romans 8, 17. We can look at that. It says, And since we are children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if you are to share his, his glory, 
we must also what? Share his suffering. 1 Peter 4, 12 to 13, please, quickly. 1 Peter 4, 12 to 13. So then, since Christ suffered physically, physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready. Why did he change it? Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery, okay, trials you are going through if something strange were happening to you. 13. Instead, be very glad for these trials. Make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you would have the wonderful joy of seeing his what? Glory when it is revealed to all the world. 1 Peter 5, 1. Next chapter. It says, And now a word to you who are elders in the churches. I too am an elder and a witness to the suffering of Christ. And I too will share in what? In his glory. And it goes on. Luke 24, 26. It goes on. It goes on. In fact, Apostle Paul understood suffering so much that he, he prayed for suffering. He says, that I may know and share in the fellowship of his suffering. Praise God. It's an evidence of that death. So the reason why maybe when we hear about suffering, we don't want, maybe it's because we have not yet died. Maybe that death has not occurred in those areas, right? Maybe. So, in conclusion, why do we call this a wonderful experience? Why do we call it a wonderful experience? Some of these things that we've learned, you know, why do we call it a wonderful experience even though death must occur, suffering and all that? Why? Because this is how men are raised in the stature of Christ. Until Man can see Christ. No person will walk through that pearly gate that does not look like Christ. No man can walk if Christ. That is why you hear Apostle Paul says, My children in whom I travel yet again in place of prayer until Christ is formed in you. Until you hear you know, to conform men to the image of Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have not yet so learned Christ to have the mind of Christ. Men must see Christ. Men must see Christ. For men to come into the kingdom, something must be different. You can't be giving them what they already have. You can't, they, they mean, you're the same thing with them. In fact, some of them even think that they're better off. But there is something, that is why I said, and the Holy Spirit will help us to open and pack the veil so that we can see. We can see. You know, I often say to people, if you see Jesus, I mean, I've not seen him, like, of course, obviously, but I know that Jesus has an impeccable character. He will be the most sweetest person to be with. He will be the most kindest person to be with. He will be the most generous person, the most gentle person to be with, the most self-controlled person to be with. Even that alone makes me to want to be like that. I want to be self-controlled like you. I want to be as gentle like you. You know, the story that amazes me, when Jesus met that two men by the work, um, well, woman of Samaria, you know the, Samar the, the Samar Samaritans, right? They don't talk to Jews. Or rather, sorry, the Jews don't talk to them. Not the Samaritans. Don't. So, because the Jews look down on them. So, when that woman came and saw Jesus by the well, not expecting Jesus to talk, and he says, give me water. So, for her to even talk to her, let alone ask her to give me water. For you to understand how they see the Samaritans. Have you ever heard the, the, about the story of the good Samaritan? He said, the Levi came and passed. The priest came. But a Samaritan... So, the woman was, and they, look at that conversation. There was never any time you could have noticed that that woman has been married for five times. What would you have called that woman if he was in our church? Married five times. He said to that woman, daughter, is there nobody here to condemn you? He said, nobody. He said, neither do I. Beautiful character. I want to know him. 
That is why men want to know him. That is why prophets want to know who they are talking about. That is why the whole of creation is talking about him. Not just about his character, but what he did for humanity. He just did not forgive us and said, you know what, I've forgiven you, I've paid the price, we'll go. He said, come and be joined hairs with me. I'm going to prepare a, prepare a place for you. So where I will be. Who does that? The love of God. Christ is everything. Christ is life. The Bible says the loving, his loving kindness is better than life. Praise God. Praise God. So what are the four things, experiences, anybody? Okay. Hunger experience. Uh, I believe that somebody else can add more, but this is what I have. So, you know, I want us to buy, bow our head and we're going to pray this prayer. So, I don't know, some of us may have forgotten this first love experience. That joy that you used to have. Maybe you, you can't feel it anymore. It's an opportunity for you to ask. Maybe you don't feel the burden of Christ. Maybe this is an opportunity. That love for God and for brethren. In fact, you don't even know what it is to love somebody the way you love yourself. Maybe your service is out of routine and not from a perfect or a heart of love. You're just doing it as a routine. It's no longer from the place of love. And maybe you have lost, lost sight of eternity. You have lost focus of eternity. Everything is all about here and now. About time. You pray and ask God, please, help me. Help me. Help me. We are nearing the end of time. We are nearing the end. This is the time for us to make sure that we put our house in order. Just think about it. When was the last time you thought about eternity and I want to be there? When was the last time you were doing things for God and it was not out of service? It was not out of routine, but of love. Oh, Lord, that I may. I love you so much. And you're doing it and you are sweeping and you're telling God I love you so much. When was the last time? Do you still have that burden that you used to have before? No burden. Okay, let me just come to church. Okay, tick. I've attended. And you check that out. Father, this is our prayer tonight. This is our prayer. Holy Spirit, brood over men. Brood over your church. Let this thing that we have listed, Lord, let it come back. The joy of salvation, we want to experience it again. We want to love. We want to love you. We want to love our neighbor. We just want to love. Help us to understand this. What love is. And give us the ability to love. Father, this is our prayer. We worship and we honor you. In the mighty name of Jesus. I don't know if there's anybody that... Perhaps you are not yet saved. You've not yet come to the knowledge of who Jesus is. And you want to begin a walk. I tell you, that experience is a beautiful experience, a salvation experience. Oh, it's, you, you feel burdens, load lifted of you. The joy of salvation. So, if there's anybody like that, in the next few minutes, let's just indicate and then we can make Genuinely, genuinely, if you, genuinely, genuinely. Okay. Father, we say thank you. We worship and we honor you. We give you praise. We give you glory. We say thank you for your body, 
We say thank you for your blood, the bread and the wine you've given to us. And so, Lord, we ask that as we partake of the table tonight, Lord, let there be that transformation within us. If your body flows in us, if your body, when we eat it within us, there must be a difference. There must be a transformation. There must be a change. If anybody is sick when they eat tonight, Lord, let them be healed. And Father Lord, we say thank you. We worship and we honor you. In Jesus' mighty name.